deep is gone My heart is full of sorrow I can't believe How much I've let you down I dread the pain That waits for me tomorrow When the sun reveals my broken dreams scattered on the ground please forgive me I need your grace to make it through all I have is you I'm at your mercy Lord I'll serve you Till my dying day, help others find the way. I'm at your mercy. Please forgive me. I can't believe the God of earth and glory would take the time care for one like me but I read in the Bible that old story how he pled for my forgiveness while he was dying on a tree please forgive me I need your grace to make it through. All I have is you. I'm at your mercy. Lord, I'll serve you. Till my dying day, help others find the way. I'm at your mercy. need your grace to make it through. All I have is you. I'm at your mercy. Please forgive me. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing by? Are you washed in the blood of the are you really trusting in His grace? Desire, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? In the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are you garment spotless? Are they blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the full, unclean, oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb.
God of all comfort, speaks peace to my soul. In the God of all comfort, speaks peace to my soul. Rough seas are calm, the winds cease to blow. No matter how dark may be. Everything will be all right when the God of comfort speaks peace to my soul. When a broken heart leaves me hurting inside, and I rain my tears. seas are calm, the winds is blown. No matter how dark may be the night, everything will be all right when the God of all comfort speaks peace to my soul. When the God of Control like him, because if I was, I'd mess it up big time. <clears throat> Thank the Lord he's in control and he knows what we need. He said he'd meet our needs. Thank him for it. Brother Mike, how about open us up in prayer tomorrow? Mike, Brother Mike, Henry. Uh, on our calendar, the ladies are going to be quilt tomorrow, April 3rd, homecoming. we we'll have no evening service that Sunday. April 17th is Easter. we we'll have no evening service that Sunday either, but <clears throat> we'll have a sunrise, 7 o'clock service, have breakfast after that service, <clears throat> <clears throat> but we'll also have regular service on Easter at 11 o'clock, but no evening service. May the 8th, Mother's Day, right around the corner. Graduation, May the 15th, some dates to remember. We're going to back up next Sunday, March 27th. We're going to have baptism here. Uh, Emerson Payne is going to be baptized. <coughs> uh, 
you know anyone graduating this year and would like to be a part of our graduation, give the secretary their name, please. Need it now, as soon as possible. We got a letter this past week. Senator Bulletin said, with the warmest and deepest heartfelt, thank you to our church family for the special calls, cards, texts, and prayers during the time of re recuperation. God blessed us as he guided the surgeon and set me on the path of healing. We continue prayers. All will heal quickly and completely. God bless each of you from Michael and Carol Hyatt. They had some surgery on his eye. We had 65 this morning in Sunday school. But, uh, just be glad I watched my brother Herb Rivers this morning. He was preaching on all of us who got complaints. They said we don't need to focus on them complaints. We need to come and thank God that, that we're able to be here. So thank you all for being here. Everybody this morning. We're going uh, we're going to go uh, highly technology through our song service this morning, which means I don't have a book. I'm going to depend on them guys, uh, and y'all going to have to depend on them too. But that's great. Let's stand together, and we're going to sing "Thank You, Lord," and then we're going to roll right into "Look What the Lord Has Done."
that was so good we need to do that one more time while they're sitting down I don't believe they can smile sitting down look what the Lord has done look what the I want you to fellowship like we normally fellowship, and let's touch each other, all right? I could tell y'all hadn't done that in a while, but all good things must come to an end. Now that you've been around and you've seen folks up close and personal, some that you don't go out the same door with at church, you could really see what the Lord had done. Some of them been sick, some of them ain't been with us in a while, and some come, all that you got to see it firsthand. Ain't God good? God is good. And all the time, amen. All right, we're going to sing one more, one that really tugs on your heart's uh, purse strings here. I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary.
some juice here in a minute i'm already juiced up them songs kind of had my my gospel bumps are rolling i believe in a hill called mount calvary man i tell you i don't know what else everybody else holds on to the bible strictly tells us if it, all you have hope is is in this life you are all men most miserable because i'll tell you they some good times and and all like that pete you want to say a word while you're here okay uh, they are miserable because, listen, I'm looking for a lot better things uh, when I get to heaven. While he's doing this, turn with me to Judges chapter 7. Them Baptist batteries, they needed recharge. say they did too no, no. oh them no, did too to oh them. all right anyway looking back at what we've been talking about is Gideon and you know all the doubt that Gideon had uh brought up but we we always look at the negative but man look what faith he had even Peter uh he done some things that we all talk about but the reason why we talk about them because we do the same things uh, we're, we're called in the same act that they are, and that's why they're in there. But we're more than overcomers. We're more than conquerors through God. It's not based on my might. It's on his might alone and, your, and his might for you as well. Uh, but we see Gideon uh, um, somewhat, I guess you would say, as uh, a little bit doubtful, uh, a little bit not fully faithful, not really believing that God could do everything. He needed a sign. He needed God to prove himself. Let me tell you, my friend, that, that cross we talked about, God had proved himself enough on the cross. Not only on the cross, on that very event that we're going to celebrate coming up very soon, 
the day that he come up forth out of the grave, the one first victorious over death, hell, and the grave. That is why I have comfort in knowing. I believe in that by faith. So Gideon, uh, he saw the sign. He met the angel of the Lord. He, uh, the angel of the Lord, he made a sacrifice. He used a staff. It consumed the sacrifice with no aid of a match or a flint rock. Just the power of God, the fire consumed that sacrifice. And, um, and he, 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 he had enough faith to do something. We know that he blew his trumpet and all his family and all the groups around him, the tribes that were hidden in all the hills, they heard the trumpet it and they gathered with him wouldn't that be amazing that we could go outside this morning uh, i remember uh as a uh, as a kid coming up there's some little towns that would have the church chimes and the church bells would ring on on sunday morning and it was time for church i know it at uh, the school i went to it in tifton up there uh we had the chapel there and it would have those chimes i don't care who you were when you heard it you just kind of Stopped a moment and, and kind of realized that that's where the church is at. You know, that, that was church time. That, that's when they would do that. And, uh, you know, we kind of missed that. But if we went out there and blowed the trumpet, it would be amazing if I just seen cars started flocking in from everywhere. Now, we can make that happen. And how we can do that, we can put a sign out there, free food going to be next Sunday, then they'd all come. Uh, but what they need the most is not the hamburgers and hot dogs and the uh, ribs and all that. What they need is salvation. They need a relationship with God. And that's the trumpet that um, Gideon blew. He blew that and folks come from all around him. But even after that, when they all gathered, I mean 32,000 gathered uh, just by one toot of the horn and they come and they was ready to do something that they hadn't done. They were tired of being enslaved. They were tired of being bit, uh, beaten down. And uh, we thought for the most part that they were ready uh, to do whatever God would have them to do. But we know then that Gideon's still in doubt. He asked, uh, uh, he says, God, don't be mad with me. Just put up with me one more time here. And he laid a fleece out. You know, and the fleece was to be on the dew and not on the ground. And then that happened. He, he wrung a bowl of water out and... Um, the, the ground was dry, and then he reversed that and says, you know, Lord, be patient with me, and uh, I want to challenge you one more time. Let there be no dew on the fleece and, and, and dew on the ground, and it was so. So we thought that, you know, that would be plenty, and Gideon was on fire, and all the people was gathered to him. But in chapter 7, uh, there's going to be um, where God redeems his children. Uh, but how he goes about doing it. You know, I, I, I thought how to word uh, maybe a, a, a theme uh, on this, you know. Uh, sometimes God don't want us to win it in such a way that we think we have anything to do with the victory. Now, you hear me? And sometimes God does things medically with us that he don't want anybody but him to get the credit. It's got to be, I can tell you, all medicine is good, but without the anointing of the Holy Ghost, there is no healing uh, in that medicine. God sees that that does what it does. And um, we need to have more faith in our God than we do our doctors and, and, and all the things. We've got to have a lot more faith in our God than we do our government. And uh, so we need to, to, to lean on him. And Gideon is getting this opportunity. Now, uh, background on Gideon, remember he was... Uh, he was not the firstborn. He wasn't all that. He come from a kind of the poor side of town, and uh, God choose, chose him. Just like he chose David, of all the brothers, he was the youngest, and God chose him to be king. Same kind of situation here. But in chapter 7, there's a, there's a battle to be fought, and God's preparing Gideon and, and Israel to go against in battle. So if you would stand with me, uh, we're going to get into a portion of this uh, message and go as far as God allows us to this morning. It says this in verse 1, Then Jerubbabel, which is Gideon, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him, rose up early and pinched pitch beside, that means camped out, beside the well of Harod, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill Mora in the valley. Now God has set the battle in a position. The enemy is now going to be in the valley, which is going to be important because if you got them there, you can hem them up. God set the stage. God said, you know, we know in the valley is where the fertile ground is. We know where that's where all the sheep went. Remember, these, these folks had 
piles of uh, livestock. And they were down there in the meadows doing those things. And then verse 2 says, And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many. For to give me the, the Midianites into, thy, into their hands, lest Israel vault themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand has saved me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, again for your, your blessed word. Lord, that it feeds us, it teaches us. Lord, that it is not in our might, but it in your might alone. Lord, let us gl uh, glean from this that we need to glean. God, let us have that. Drop us a handful of purpose here this morning. Lord, that we reach down and get just that that you would have us to get. And God, that it would brighten our soul, it would encourage us, it would make us more faithful. God, it would make us love you more. For there's no other one worthy of worship and praise but you. Go with us now, have your willing way, God. And all God's people said, Amen. We look at this particular uh, passage of Scripture. Now, there's around 130 to 145,000 uh, of the Midianites and the Amorites down in this valley. And uh, they're, they're, they're tremendous. And I not, not count when you see them travel with all the livestock. It is a sight to behold. I mean, it, the, the Bible described it as grasshoppers moving across the ground. Y'all remember when we used to have those army-looking grasshoppers, those black ones? Y'all remember them? How to come out? Well, another one for the hay farmers. You know what army worms look like going in the, in the hay field? Well, you can't hardly see them until you get down there. Man, they just are working all over. This is what they look like according to what God said. And now there's only 32,000 gathered together, and God tells Gideon, man, you got too many. There's too many. If I let this, this whole group go in there and get delivered them into your hands, and he said they will vault themselves. They will think that they had done something, and they wouldn't realize that uh, I'm the one that's doing it for them because I want them to turn into me. I want them to, meet, to, to, to let me lead them instead of them trying to get ahead of me. Could you imagine the thought that Gideon received all that? Maybe he was scratching his head going, Dear Lord, we, we, we're down now four to one, maybe five to one. We're, we're down that many, and I got too many. Let me tell you, sometimes I've seen this happen. You know, I've seen a church grow when they didn't have a pastor. And I've also seen a church grow when the numbers weren't good. They grew in spiritual uh, relationship with Christ. I've seen it both cases. Sometimes God does this, and, and we don't know the reason why until... You know, later on, and, and, and we makes us stronger as we depend on the Lord. And, and, and here, he's going to take away the army uh, of the 32,000, which to me, I think they need every one of them. It's kind of like Ukraine and Russia. You know, it's just kind of looking at that picture, and I don't know why we fell here like we did. It's just God's talking, and we're listening. And we look here, and it says, he says, mine own hand, he says, have saved me. In verse 3, he says, now therefore, he says, go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart uh, early from Mount Gilead. He says, and then there returned of the people 20 and 2,000, and there remained 10,000. Oh, my goodness. They lost half. A little over half. That was 32,000. Now uh, 12,000 left. I mean, I mean 20,000 left and 22,000 left. And now they're down to 10,000. You go, oh, my Lord. But there's something here. And I'm going to be frank and, and honest as I can about what I'm fitting to say. I never knew that this was a common practice in the war days of Israel. But I do know it now. And I want to share scripture with you to show what the priest would do. Now, you hear me. Who is acting as priest now? God is acting as the priest. He's in direct relationship with Gideon, but he did the work of a priest. I want you, if you can and will, flip over with me to the book of Deuteron Deuteronomy chapter 20. I want you to listen. I know this is time consuming, but this is meat for your soul. Why did God use this particular uh, practice? Because he used it, and they used it in the days before. 
Now listen to me what it says in verse 1 of chapter 20 of Deuteronomy. It says, he says, When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies, and seest horses and chariots and, and people more than thou, he says, Be not afraid of them. For the Lord thy God is with thee, he says, which has brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be when you are come nigh unto the battle that the priest shall approach and speak unto them. Now I want you to listen. A priest is fitting to come out. You would think he was going to do what? He was going to pray. He was going to pray for them. He was going to bless them in this battle. But listen to his words. And he spake and he said unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint, fear not, and do not tremble. Neither be terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is, is he that goeth with you to fight for you against the enemies to save you. Now listen to this. And the officers spake unto the people, saying, What man is there that hath built a new house and hath not dedicated it yet? Let him go and return into his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man dedicate it. And what man is there that hath planted a vineyard and have not eaten of it? Let him go and return into his house, lest he die in battle, and another man eat of it. He says, And what man is there that hath betrothed a wife or engaged to a woman and not have taken her, not married her? And, and let her go and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle and another man take her. Now that's, that's all well and good. I think that's thoughtful. I understand those thoughts. But here's the kicker. And the officers spake further unto the people, and they shall say, What man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return unto his house, lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. What does that mean, Brother Jamie? Well, they practiced that in the day. They practiced that at that particular time. They, they said the same things. The word of the Lord came to Gideon. He rehearsed this thing in the same manner that the priest did in Deuteronomy. And amazingly, people would go. Now, he gave three of the, the situations an out to go. But here's what basically it is. There's two things that he says. If you're scared and your heart is faint, if you don't want to be here, we don't want you here. Do you hear me? Would you want to be in a foxhole with a guy that says, man, I, my, my, my mom and daddy made me join the service. My, you know, I didn't want to be here. I was in jail and they offered this to me as an out. I don't want to be here. I'm going, man, these bullets coming. I'm going to die for you or you're going to die for me. They don't want the faint hearted. They don't want the ones that are fearful in there. Listen, God wants people that are sold out for the cross of Christ in today's time not to be faint hearted, to carry the mantle of the Lord Jesus Christ for what he done on the cross of Calvary. He wants those kind of people. God can use a few to do a lot. The Bible says little is much when God is in it. And here we see that uh, uh, Gideon is standing before these people and, and immediately 22,000 walks away by just being admitting they're fearful. They don't have faith in Israel's God, but yet God had protected them, had hid them in the rocks and the caves and the mountains and all those things. But yet, he said, he gives them an out. And you know what? And they wouldn't hold it against them. They wouldn't hold it against them. They just let them go because that was the normal thing. God wants people who want Him. Not people who are drove to Him. God can use those who are willing and able to work for Him. And that's who's going to receive the blessing. And when they receive the blessing, the multitudes will also receive the fruits of their labor. Listen, it ain't for no one to point fingers at those that were fearful, those that were faint of heart. It wasn't that. It was that we could get the true believers, the true followers, to come together with one mind and one accord as they did in the day of Pentecost. And the mighty power of God fell through the Holy Ghost of God. And there, there's so many got saved and they started a church, which we know is the church of the living God, as we know it today. Things changed then. Thank God that Jesus was on the cross. Thank Thank God he was victorious in the grave. Thank God he sits on the right hand of the Father today making intercession for you and I. 
You would think at this moment, now, did Gideon deserve this kind of treatment? I think so. I think so. He deserved this. If anybody needed to be encouraged to be more faithful, it was Gideon. He done laid out the fleece twice. He done uh, saw and met with the angel of the Lord who could have been Jesus Christ incarnate. We do not know that. But there was a change because he thought he would die. He would thought he would die. Brother Randall asked me that question the other day. And I believe like him, I believe it must have been. You know, oh, Jesus wasn't around because this is an Old Testament. My friend, he's been around since the beginning, whenever that was. I believe he had saw the Lord face to face that day and he was worried about it killing him. And now we see that uh, that imprint on his mind, it encouraged him even though he laid out the fleece and he'd done all those things. Now God has taken away uh, two-thirds of the army. Now let's pick back up and read. It says, And the Lord said unto Gideon, After all these people had walked away, the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. Come on. Are you, re- are you sincere? You know, it seems like we do it a lot today, a lot more today with less. We are. Less people are doing the same works that many more people were doing today. And we're still surviving. And it's only by the grace of God to put to the truth of the word of God that a man that would work and abide for his family, God will take care of him. And here we see that God's telling him, he says, there's still too many. There's still too many. You know, David thought pretty good of the 10,000 that he had because they were not fearful. They was ready to charge hell with a water pistol. They was ready to go do whatever they needed to do. The thing that's amazing to me is it don't speak of no kind of um, weapons. No kind of weapons. We're going to find out. I'm going to throw this out there. We're pretty much going to, he's going to win this battle with the band members. Just thought I'd say that. And the Lord spake unto Gideon, he said, The people are yet too many. He says, Bring them down unto the water. He says, And I will try them for thee there. He says, You let me, I'm going to do the try. And you bring them down there, and I'm going to pick. I'm going to pick. Now, what is God looking for? First of all, he, he, we know that these guys said they're not fearful. We know that these guys said they're not uh, faint of heart, that they're willing to do that. But are they prepared? That's the key ingredient here. Are they prepared? In other words, are we prepared? Are are we prepared daily to keep an eye on, make sure that the devil don't throw something in front of you that trips it up in your life, that trip that that throws a, a bolter in your life, that you fall for the things of the devil, that destroys your ministry, I mean your ministry and also your testimony and your life and your family and, and all that you would ever work for. The devil is out there to do that. He was looking for those guys who were sincere, who would never take take their eyes off on the gold and that was to keep their eyes on Jesus and on Gideon and know for a fact that if they followed him they would be victorious. Why? Because he said so. You know that's all we needed. That's all I needed when I was coming up as a kid my dad would say why why are we going to do that? Because I said so. So we went from there. There weren't no more questions after that because he said so. Listen my friend you must be born again. Why? Because Jesus said so. You must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart and soul and mind and you must ask Him to forgive your sins. Why? Because He said so. And He's got the right to have the say so. He died for us. And then in verse 5 He says, So He brought them down, the people down into the water and the, the Lord said unto Gideon, He says, Everyone that lappeth of the water with his tongue as a dog lappeth shall, uh, him shall thou set by himself. He says, And likewise, everyone that boweth down upon his knees to drink. Put them over here. He says, And the number of them that lap putting their, their hand to their mouth and he says, and, and th- it were 300 men. He says, but all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. And the Lord said it again. And he says, by the 300 men that lap, will I, he says, will I save you and deliver the many nights in thy hand and let all the other people go, every man unto his place. Wow. We at 32,000. Now we're at ten. Now we at 300. Now I'm not going to say that that represents a certain percent that's this or that. I'm not saying that. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. That's what he wound up with. 
But I do know in these 300, they would do whatsoever they were told to do. And it didn't matter how strange it is that God would give them a mission to do. How strange it may be, God uses things. The Bible tells us that God uses the foolishness things of the world to confound the wise. But yet for the glory of God would he do those things and wonder why are you doing that? You ever been asked why you go down there to that church? Why do you pay your money down there at that church? Why do you do all this right here? Listen, it ain't for me to explain. I love the Lord Jesus. He loved me and I never can give back what he's given to me. He's given me life, eternal life. And there's no way you can buy that with money. So I have to give him my life. That's all I got that is even worth anything. And it's not worth much. But I give it to him. So we down to 300 people. And here's what they chose. If there was... Out of the 10,000, there was that 9,700 people when they got to the water. He told them all. Could you imagine? They obeyed pretty good, didn't they? He got them all down there to this body of water, and there they are laying out. You know, he said, now scatter out along the banks. I want you to do something. And they were obedient because when he said drink, they drank. Because I, I believe, you know, they were true soldiers. They, 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 they acted like true soldiers. They'd done what they said they would do. But what they didn't know is some was prepared and some wasn't prepared. Didn't they know already through the message that Gideon had told them that God was fixing to send them into battle, that they needed to, to, to come, and that's why they were. And if you're afraid of dying, if you're afraid of doing this, go home. So he sifted back through them, and by this is what he done. He says, and I'll, I'll tell you the, the story. The ones, the most of the ones that went home, the 9,700 that went home, they bowed down on their hands and knees, and, and, and they got down like this, and they drank out, out, of the, out of the water like this, and they put their lips to the water. Now, uh, uh, you know what? I, I can't see Brother Michael back there. You know what? All I can see, what I do see I see myself. And I think when you look at that and how they drunk the water, that really the reason why they were only looking, and that also was a mirror. That, that looking in there was seeing myself, but also I could see if anybody come up on me. But it wasn't your own back who you was covering here. You was covering the back of the army of the Lord, and you didn't need to put yourself in a position that not just you would be coming to harm, but God's people wouldn't come into harm. Now, we, we, we tell them to all go home. Could you imagine the conversation when they got back? Could you imagine going to a military home and walking back and your mom and dad says, Son, he says, I thought you were of the counted of the 10,000. Why didn't you come back? They said, Dad, I have no idea. I don't know why that they sent me back home. We drank water when they told us to drink water. And, and, and that's all I know, but they sent me home. You know, it was kind of like being dishonorably discharged. You know, if God looked upon our faithfulness and he would do those things which he will not do, if we could be dishonorably discharged for not doing the proper things that God has equipped us to be in this life, you know, he gives us the armor of God which does everything in the world for us except protects our back. These guys, when they got down on their hands and knees, their back was not protected. They could not see anything coming. And he sent them home. So the thing got up, but the deal with God is, he says, 10,000 is too many. Nobody believed that I could even take a 10,000 army. And he says, some of these guys would think, well, we just got some tough 10,000 guys. We, our strategy just was so good and all like that. God says, I'm going to eliminate that. I'm going to fix it where they only know that God had a hand in this, that God had a hand in it. No other way. I'm going to tell you, in this life when we live, when the last thing we have, we're going to know when we go to heaven that God had a hand in it. God had a hand in it. And I know he's got a hand in it. And I'm preparing to go there because I know his hand is the only one that matters. I don't care if, if Vladimir Putin or whoever is going crazy at this moment, even the government that we have, how crazy it is. I know my general. I know my heavenly father. I know the, the king of kings and the Lord of lords and who I stand with and how we're going to win. We're going to win. It don't matter what happens in this world down here. We're going to be with him one day. 
And if the, if the world believed that today, we would have five services a day, seven days a week in the house of God, praising and worshiping an almighty God that died for the, the cause of the whole world, not just for the United States of America, but every soul that was conceived in the womb of a woman. Christ died not only the past, the present, but even the future people that's going to be born in this world. He did that. And now we're down to 300. But the unique part about these guys that, that, that did their part, the, the, the guy that did the right thing, did anyone give them a heads up? Why no? These guys were prepared. I believe they were Bible students. I believe they knew what God says. God says to beware at all times that the devil will come to you and, and you will face the fiery darts of the spirits of the, uh, of the demons of this world. To be prepared, always be looking. Pray without ceasing. I think that's a part of that. Them guys was in a position to defend themselves, whatever happened. So they bowed down and they kept their head up and they scooped them up a handful of water and they drank from their own hand and they were still looking and looking around to see if anybody was coming at that moment. Moment. You got to remember, they were on the edge of the battlefield. My friend, I think in America today and the worldwide, we're on the edge of the battlefield. We don't need to stoop down and take our eyes off the cross. We, if we get thirsty, we need to dip it up and put it in our mouth and keep our eyes on the cross where Jesus died for us. We need to keep our eyes there in Gethsemane where he was willing to uh, lay down his life and turn himself in to be arrested, then beaten and then nailed to a cross. We need to keep our eyes on the tomb, the tomb that wasn't even his. It was a borrowed tomb. There that day that he rolled the stone away in the power of God. God, and he walked forth victorious in the flesh and he went to be with the heavenly father and he did that for you and I and proved himself to over 500 people he proved himself in the spirit of God he proved himself by the word of God and the Bible says the word of God is what sets us free today because it's the living body of Christ well 300 You got to go back. You got to go back into the feast. Every time there was a feast, these guys were trained. When they when they when they, when they done the, the the feast of the Passover in those days, the first thing we see that Jesus I issued out unto the disciples there in that upper, upper room, the Last Supper as we know it, you know, before they actually demonstrated the Lord's Supper there, he passed them the cup. And they all drank out of the cup. And, and the cup was important. I believe those guys realized that there was power in the cup. There was, there was power. They would cup their hands and they would drink out of that. God has equipped them. Why? They were prepared. Have you ever got off somewhere, and I know I have. Fat boy has a trouble sometimes. I'll get hungry, and you, you go to the Dollar General and get you any kind of that or canned groceries. I know they ain't good for you, but some of them's good to you. Smoked or, no, you know what I mean. It's whatever you got a hankered for, chicken. You know, you go in there. So I got me some one day, and I got out to the truck. I had me some smoked oysters. Oh, had bought me some saltine crackers and a little bottle of hot sauce, and man, I was on my way. I mean, I was doing my thing. I mean, it, it, it tastes like I was on a fishing trip. I pulled under me an oak tree. I was about to starve to death, and I opened that baby up, and I said, I ain't got a fork. I ain't got a fork. Man, I was just mad. Now, that didn't stop me. I done made up my mind. It hadn't stopped me. But the problem for me about being prepared I, I turned that lens, you know, uh, old logger, he figures out how to do stuff. You know, you get out there without a fork, you ain't in trouble. You just take that lid and you bend it and you make it into a spoon and, and, and you make a dipper out of it. So I, I improvised and, and made that dip. But the problem for me not being prepared is the first couple of times I was so hungry and wanting to get that smoked oyster in my mouth with that dab of hot sauce on it, I put it on that cracker and I dab that thing in it and I crammed that can in my mouth and I cut both my lips right there. Because I wasn't prepared. I wasn't prepared. I didn't do what I should have done. The men that were equipped with the cups and realized how God had made them and God wanted them to do their thing and do their duty and keep their eyes on the enemy and be on the lookout for the things that could destroy them. He gave them a cup and they used that cup. God says, that's the guy I want. 
That's the guy I want. He can improvise even in tough times like this. No, we didn't bring a goblet for them. We didn't bring a, a water dipper. We didn't do like that. I have equipped them and prepared them and they remembered what to do and they used what the God had created in them and they was able to continue and do their service even handicapped that they didn't have a cup to drink from. Let me tell you, my friend, this world is trying to handicap the Word of God. It's trying to handicap the Christians to get the message out. It's trying to keep us busted up and scattered all out because if we do that, we can't be strong in numbers. But I got news for you, my friend, as long as we drink out of the cup that was filled by Emmanuel's veins, the blood that run down the cross of Calvary, and we drink out of that one cup, I'll tell you, my friend, there's nothing on earth, in the earth, or above the earth that can stand against that. Even the devil himself and the third of the angels cannot be defeated. He is a defeated foe as we speak right now. He knows he's whipped. He knows he's on his way to the devil's hell. There he'll be cast for eternity. He's just trying to destroy as many people as he can. And the world don't know it. And right now he's using drugs and fentanyl and, and all the things they are. And a young man, a, 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 a bunch went on a spring break the other day and they took some crack laced with fentanyl or something like that and they was just going to get them a real buzz for a good time and it killed them. That's the devil for you. You know why them guys wasn't prepared? They went down there with that on their mind. If a little bit of this, that's what the problem, that's the problem with Satan. He'll get you to try a little bit of something and oh that's so good. That you, you know if I took a little bit more it'd get better. You know if I did a little bit more I'd do better. You know, I had a, I'm not going to mention his name, I had a neighbor and farmer one time that was just eat up with nut grass. Y'all know what that is? Brother Mike does. Yellow nut sedge. It's a more common word. It's a bad dude. It's a bad dude. There's a little nut under the ground and it comes up and it'll just choke everything out. So he got, he was with Southern States, which gold kiss back in them days. And they brought out some stuff to his farm and said, he said, listen, to, he said, this stuff will, will really work if you use it two or three years in a row and it'll control that nut grass. He tried it that first year, and he saw some results. And the next year, uh, he says, okay. He says, I want twice as much as I had last time. I want twice as much as I had last time. They said, you going to grow more corn? No. Nope. He said, what? You? He said, I believe if a little bit will do a little bit of good, a whole lot will do a whole lot of good. And he didn't make no corn. No corn. But that's how the devil tries to tempt you. He's going to say, this really works good. Nobody can detect it, and it's all like this. And you just know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you can take this and live on. And I can tell you, my friend, it won't do nothing but make you want more and more of it. It'll drag you further and further down. It'll carry you into the pits of hell where the only thing in this world that you know is to be among people that are like you at that point. That's the only group that'll accept you is the people that are like you. And there he'll take you and separate you from the love of God. If someone don't reach out and it's God's people who's got to do that, reach out and do that in spite if it ain't but 300 of us to do it. 300. We have a voice because these guys, the Bible says, and I want to read one more. I'm going to cut it off. and We're not getting to the battle, but we'll get to the battle tonight. But I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you. And it says when those 300 in the next scripture there, he says when them 300 that were chosen, they sent the rest of them cats back home. You know what they carried with them? A trumpet. They were members of the band. No, it's like in the band, people. Hey, if you can toot a toot and you want to get up here and help us, I'd be glad for you to. But they carried a trumpet. And the Bible says they carried their lamps. You know, and it, it was like the wise versions. I promise you they were full of oil because these were the prepared 300 out of the 32,000. And as far as I can recollect, that was weapon of choice. I want to put that in today's language. The Bible says, let your light so shine. Our lamp. Our lamp. And how do you do that? With your trumpet. And where is the trumpet located on your body? Your mouth. It's your trumpet. Tell the world. Use it. Let his light so shine in you that man can see Christ in you. 
and tell him about the great things that he has done. Let him, uh, let him uh, you show the love of God. Hey, let me tell you, it's just a few. You know, about uh, almost a hundred of us gathered to put the word of God together the other night and we send it out. That's a small amount according to the amount of people that are in Brantley County. That's a small amount according to the number of people that's in the state of Georgia. And it sure is a small amount based on the number of people that's in the United States of America. But my friend, that word will not go out and come back void. It will accomplish the purpose that God would have indeed for it to do. And we do a little bit. We'll take care of a lot. Actually that night if the numbers are true, nearly 11,200 people will come to know the Lord from a small group that is no bigger than about a hundred. Let your light so shine and toot your horn. Well what does your horn say? Your horn is to praise the almighty God. That's all. Your testimony of salvation is enough to change people's minds to go back to the song. We sung one song. I don't know if y'all followed that. And y'all, y'all don't know how this gets created, but Christy's are doing a great job, led by the Spirit of God. And she, she helps the old preacher. What was that first song? Huh? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And, you know, I, it's just coming to me now. I'm just telling you, it's just coming to me. This is hot off the press. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. And then the very next song after that has been done, Look what the Lord hath done. You know, I remember a day when I was that happy. I remember that day, and I'm kind of happy about it right now, Brother David. I mean, I could dance a jig. I think about, you know, when you get happy in the Lord because of what he's done, you realize you didn't deserve what it is. Man, you can get all fired up about that thing, man. The Lord Jesus is going to come back, and he's coming for me, and I'm going to live with him forever. That ain't a selfish thing, my friend. The the salvation thing is a personal thing. I can't save you. You have to talk to the Lord for Him to save you. If you you know you're born again, then why aren't you living for Him? If you're born again, why aren't you prepared? Why aren't you one of them that carries the cup and the trumpet and the lamp? Why aren't you one that makes a difference in a lost and dying world? We can and we will. Little is much when God's in. Don't think of yourself a minor help. You are a major help when God's in the mix. You know, so far, we think Gideon is gung-ho. But God's got something else, reassurance, in store for Gideon tonight. Oh, it's exciting. When things going on in our life and we're going through some troubles and we don't know how we're going to deal with it, how it's going to turn out and how's that at. Somewhere when you're still depending on the Lord and you're still praying on it, ain't heard a thing yet, all of a sudden somewhere, some little something comes up that gives you some reassurance. Glory to God. It ain't happened yet. But he'll throw something out there. <laughs> Ooh, it's going to be all right. <laughs> it's going to be all right. Lord, I ain't even been there. Are you going to keep? No, you're going to have to go through this, but it's going to be all right. Well, the, the news ain't good. He <laughs> said, oh, it's going to be. You go take your medicine. You go testify at the dump. You go. Everything will be all right. Trust him. Because everything's going to be all right. Let's stand. Father, (laughs) we don't deserve that kind of love. But God, when you reassure us and we get confirmation from the throne of glory that everything is going to be all right. God, we can't help but weep and we can't help but thank you. We couldn't do it on our own. No man could bring us this far. But God, you saw fit 
to love us enough to help us. God, we're here today by the grace of God. We're here today, and it's appointed, it's a divine thing that we're here today. This was for them, and this was for me. God, help us. And God, if there's some that's not sure, never made that profession, maybe some are living unprepared. Maybe they wouldn't be one of those that got chosen of the 300 because they're not always faithful. God, that we'd be faithful. And God, we'd be able to carry the load, whatever it is, and however far it takes us, even unto death. Because to be absent from the body would be present with the Lord. God, thank you for that reassurance right there. Be with this invitation, Lord. Let the Holy Spirit move on hearts. Change people's minds, and those minds change their hearts. In Jesus' name. and thank God for the message today because it wasn't mine Amen Amen Will you dismiss us